Last week, we, we spent some time doing some apologetics, and I hope that was helpful to you. Um, you know, just having a, a, a basic foundation for how to answer people who have criticism for your faith. I think that's important. And this week, it's going to be a little more um, of a sensitive topic. We're going to talk about uh, what the scriptures say about homosexuality. And, you know, that's fun. Who's excited for that? Probably everyone here, more than me. <laughs> more than me, at least. Uh, and look, folks, um, I really don't care what somebody does with their own life and their own time. You know, that's the beauty of freedom, right? Um, I'm free, and you're free. We're all free. We can make our own choices. Uh, but I think it's a fair thing to say that if you're going to make your own choices as a free person, you should know the consequences of your choices, right? So um, I don't feel like a, a great burden to talk people out of their lifestyles. I don't at all. Uh, in fact, I'd rather just be somebody's friend first, and if they want to then invite me a dialogue about what I believe, then that's great. I would love to do that. But I don't, I know people who believe uh, very strongly against me and I can be friends with them. I don't, ha I don't have like a, a secret motive. Uh, but it's important to know why you believe what you believe. It's important to be able to have an answer for when that person does invite you into a dialogue and you should know how to explain why homosexuality and the, the Christian faith based on scriptures are not compatible, okay? And I don't mean, and you know, here's the hard thing about this, is anything you say negatively against something else somebody believes in always sounds like judgment. But all I can say is this, I'm not here to judge a person. I, in, again, you're free, I'm free, do what you want to do. I'm just here to tell you what the Bible says. Now, you can do with that what you want, but that's you, not me, right? I'm only responsible for what I believe to be true, all right? And then, of course, I have a, a responsibility as a pastor to preach then the scriptures to, to people who would want to hear me preach, okay? So uh, if you disagree with anything I say, that's great. That's fine. I, I don't feel threatened by it. I hope you don't feel threatened by it. I hope you can listen and disagree with grace and compassion in the same way I would listen and disagree with you in grace and compassion, okay? Is that fair? All right, fair. Fair is fair. And I think the high schoolers are coming in, so... Uh, if you, don't, if you have a high schooler that's coming in, you don't want them to hear about sex, sex stuff, then kick them out. And then you can decide later if you want them to listen on a, on a later date. But uh, I'm going to talk about it. Okay, the S word. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. God, you are good, you are gracious, you are kind. And Lord, I need lots and lots and lots of grace on my life especially in this moment. So would you come, Holy Spirit, and empower us to hear your revelation. God, prune my tongue to only speak what you would have me speak. We, we trust you. Amen. All right, to understand what the Bible, and this is just going to be real basic. I, what I want to do is just give you confidence in how to explain um, the scriptures to people, okay? But to, to understand uh, what the Bible says about homosexuality or LGBTQZ, whatever, uh, and it is it is funny. I don't, you know, uh, it's easy to poke fun at people, right? So let's. In order for me to do this today, and I've I'm guilty. I've made fun of the the alphabet mafia more than anybody in here. I'm sure I have, but today let's just treat this as we're trying to understand. So that those who are in, the, in this lifestyle, who we desire for them to be our brothers and sisters, would come to a place of understanding our perspective. Okay, Let's pretend tonight for a moment that all we want to do is in love explain our perspective to people who think differently from us. 
Okay? Is that fair? So I'm going to try not to make a lot of jokes because I want to be sensitive uh, to the fact that, that these are human people we're talking about, lives, souls. You know what I'm saying? So let, this will be the last one, the alphabet mafia. That's pretty funny, but that's the last joke, okay? All right, to understand what the Bible says about homosexuality, you first have to understand what the Bible says about human sexuality in broad strokes, okay? Once you understand what God says about human sexuality, it becomes abundantly clear on what God says about homosexuality, all right? And again, I don't care if um, somebody, I, I like freedom. Do you like freedom? Yeah. To like freedom for yourself, you also have to like freedom for the people around you too. Freedom doesn't work unless it's available for everybody, all right? So that's why our country is so great. We have institutions where people can disagree. That's good. Debate is good, right? This is, this is a good thing. I don't have a problem with people disagreeing with me and living in their own expression of freedom in their own way, in their own groups. What I do have a problem with is people who want to revise the scripture to make it say something that it clearly doesn't. That's a problem for me, okay? Especially what the scriptures say about sexuality, marriage, and sin. I also have a problem with people who try to pressure children and other vulnerable parts of society into accepting unnatural ideologies such as transgenderism or any other ideology that pressures people to define themselves by any sort of sexual impulse or preference. I have a problem with that, okay? So I have a problem with redefining the Bible. I have a problem with pressuring young people to accept ideologies, especially without their parents' consent. I have a problem with the perception that the LGBTQ, I, don't, I, don't, I just genuinely don't know the other parts of that anymore, community is an oppressed people group that needs to be exclusively privileged in order to be considered equal. I think that's a dangerous thing when we try to take one uh, group, uh, and it's not even a people group, it's just one community, and give them privilege over every other group community in hopes that they'll become equal that way. That's just a form of oppression, right? What you're doing is you're privileging one group and oppressing one group, and that just doesn't work, right? I have a problem with people publicly celebrating their sexual impulses and forcing others to accept and celebrate that with them. I don't like that. You know, like, you know what would be gross? If married people had parades celebrating how they like to have sex with one another, right? Wouldn't that be gross? Especially if you're a teenager, like mom and dad are trying, <laughs> ew, right? So why, why are we doing that with LG Pride Month and, and Pride, that's gross, it's very gross. So I have a problem with that. I have a problem, I have no problem with people who struggle with same-sex attraction. I don't feel that there's a specific variety of sin that is more uh, con um, that we need to condemn worse than any other sin. I feel uh, like I can have healthy relationships in within a church body with people who struggle with um, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, same-sex attraction. As long as we're making the same focus, the focus. That's not, not a problem for me. If Jesus is the focus and we're all coming to him for healing through repentance of our sin, then it's not an issue for me. That, that is a non-issue, okay? So I don't have a problem with somebody who struggles with same-sex attraction. I, and I'll tell you a story about a young man who I employed um, who was just really, he was just me and him in my food truck, and he was just uncomfortable around me, just very uncomfortable around me. And one day... Uh, I just heard the Holy Spirit, this is weird, I don't, wouldn't do this in normal circumstances, but it's just really a strong Holy Spirit uh, conviction. Ask him if he struggles with same-sex attraction. And I did, I said, hey, this is going to be really weird for both of us, but do you struggle with same-sex attraction? He said, yes. And he just had shame all over his face and guilt. And I said, it's okay, it's not a problem that you struggle, just don't surrender to what you struggle to, struggle with. Okay, so the struggle's not the problem. 
the fact that you surrender to what you struggle with is the problem, okay? And I kept him employed for quite a while longer. Uh, he moved on. I think he's doing well. I think he just, um, he lives a life of celibacy now, which is, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul says that's great. Uh, so anyways, I don't have a problem with people who struggle. People who struggle are, are, are not a problem. The, the scriptures teach us that we, the scriptures, scriptures teach us that we identify our sin so that the Holy Spirit can come and heal us from our sin, okay? So all of us have to be aware of where we fall short of the glory of God, not so that we can identify by it, not so that we can make what we're calling our sin our identity, but so we can invite the Holy Spirit to come and heal us and convict us and grow us and move us. And so the scriptures are abundantly clear on what moral sexuality looks like and there really is no question uh, that sex is only healthy one way. And does anybody want to guess? Marriage, yeah, you got it. Nailed it. Marriage, the covenant of marriage. All right, so let me just, this is just important to, to lay out in the beginning. Any sexual activity, so anything, homosexuality, uh, uh, polygamy, uh, pornography, um, what else? We can make a list, right? Any sort of sexual activity outside of the marriage covenant is considered sin. Okay? So any sort of sexual activity outside the marriage covenant is considered sin. All right? Jesus was clear about his stance on the practice of sexuality outside of marriage, and that's Matthew 19. He explains that. And then furthermore, any New Testament scripture uh, that uses the phrase sexual immorality or sexual idolatry, that's uh, a Greek uh, word called pornea. And what that word is is a catch-all for any sort of sexual activity that is outside of marriage and therefore is sinful. All right? So oftentimes... Um, Critics would say, well, Jesus never specifically said homosexuality. Well, no, he said sexual immorality, and he was saying pornea, and that word was including that because there's other parts of Old Testament Scripture and New Testament Scripture that affirm the, the fact that there's no healthy sexual activity outside of the marriage covenant, okay? So any sinful sexual activity outside marriage covenant is sexual immorality or uh, sexual idolatry. And when you see those phrases in the New Testament, it's pornea. And that's just a catch-all. That's anything outside the marriage covenant. All right, any questions about that so before we go on? All right. So, of course, there's the first time we see this uh, in Scripture is Leviticus 18.22. And uh, basically, the Lord says, do not practice homosexuality. Uh, it is an abomination. And maybe we could put that up on the screen. Is anybody back there? I'm sorry. Are the, do I need to turn TVs on to do that? Okay. He's got me. Leviticus 18.22. Maybe I'll make sure I got the right scripture while he's doing that. Wouldn't that be funny? It is? All right. I knew it was. I just, you know, got nervous. <laughs> oh, okay, there it is. Uh, do not practice homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman. It is a detestable sin or an abom abomination. And so what does that mean, an abomination? It means uh, literally that it is unnatural or it's contrary to God's spiritual and physical, natural design for your life. Um, so that means that homosexuality is not compatible with the marriage covenant. And so what if you try to make the argument, okay, it says it right here plainly, but isn't that Old Testament? Isn't that Old Covenant? You know, didn't Jesus strike a new covenant? All right, well, what other old covenant, covenant laws can we strike from the records? How about thou shall not murder? 
You know, because Jesus created a new covenant, can I murder people now? Or how about, thou shall not steal? I'm going to identify as a thief because that's just how I feel I was born. And so I'm just going to steal because it's old covenant. Right? What about, thou shall not give fault witness against your neighbor? Should I just become, should I just identify as a liar because I have an unquenchable, impulsive desire to lie to other people about other people? And it's old covenant, so I mean, it's struck from the record, isn't it? No, no, no. Jesus never said that the Old uh, Testament commands don't apply to the New Testament covenant, okay? In fact, this is what he says in Matthew 5, 17. He says, this is Jesus' words, don't misunderstand why I have come. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the, the prophets. So did Jesus come to abolish the law of Moses? No. How about the writings of the prophets? No. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Okay, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment, Okay, so if you feel like uh, Leviticus 18 is the least commandment, if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God, God's law and teachings will be called them teach it and laws and teaches them, excuse me, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so Jesus didn't abolish the old covenant laws. He didn't abolish the writings of the prophet. He fulfilled them. So that means that if you get caught in your sin, you don't have to die to pay the wages of your sin. All right? You don't have to sacrifice anything. You don't have to be stoned to death. You don't have to practice uh, ritualistic festivals and traditions in order to atone for your sin. Jesus fulfilled what you couldn't fulfill through his sacrifice on the cross. All right? So he didn't come to abolish, he came to accomplish their purpose. What's the purpose of the law? To point out your sin, right? To, to reveal to us that we're not holy. So then what did Jesus come do? He absolved us of the penalty we owe and then made us holy through his sacrifice, all right? So if you're going to try to throw that out, you got a lot of work to do. you got a lot of old uh, covenant laws that I'm really quite fond of, right? That you have to sort of throw out. And you really just have to become an anarchist if you want to believe that the old covenant uh, laws don't apply to your life. All right, so is, that, is everybody good with that? Any questions about that? Marcus has a question. He's just like Jeopardy. Bing, bing, bing. <laughs> what is Leviticus 18:22? Uh, so homosexuality is still a sin, and anyone who practices it is actually living outside of God's will, okay? And why did God make a rule against homosexuality? Can anybody guess why God made a rule against it? Huh? Because, well, because people would actually want to do that, right? Obviously, there's a law for it because eventually people would discover it and desire to do it, all right? People figure out how to do things that they think feel good to them. But just because something feels good, does that make it a good thing for you? You know what else feels really good? Just pounding a chocolate cake at 10 o'clock at night. That feels great, doesn't it? Huh? Until you get through, right, yeah. And that's living until the last piece, right? Okay. So if the def um, so if it feels good, doesn't mean it is good, right? If you have an appetite for it, doesn't mean you need to fill your your appetite with something that brings harm to you. All right. So again, going back to Leviticus 18, is it the desire that defiles a person? No. No. Right. In fact, it says don't practice, all right? So the rule there is because 
obviously he knew people would desire it. And so to cut off people from acting on their impulses and desires, God created a command. All right? So we all deal with temptation. Every single one of us. You can lie all you want, but we all know that the person sitting next to you deals with sin, sinful desires just like you do. Okay? And your desires, the things that tempt you, is not what defiles you. It's what you do with those desires that defile you. Okay? Because just like heterosexual physical intimacy, homosexual physical intimacy releases endorphins that create pleasant experiences for the people involved. Right? So God knew when he was creating this law that people would have the desire for it and that some people would act upon that desire in a way that is dishonoring towards themselves and even in the action of that desire, that there would be endorphins released, right? I mean, for those of us who are married and have practiced the marriage dance, we know there's endorphins that are released. And those endorphins are telling us, this is amazing. You love this. This feels great. Enjoy it. I mean, the youth pastors are laughing more than the youth. That's incredible. The, the marriage dance. What else do you call it? The, the, well, let's think, the, uh, the covenant tango? I don't know. <laughs> the wedding two-step? I'm not sure. <laughs> Endorphins are being released, that people would like it, okay? There's a reason people practice it. It's not because it's painful, Right? People aren't just doing it because it's painful. People are doing it because it's an enjoyable experience. Endorphins are being released. And we should acknowledge that, all right? So just let's just think for a moment. Let's just think for a moment. So imagine if someone is abused when they're younger by someone of the same sex in a way that isn't overtly violent, right? And I know a lot, like... Being a youth pastor, I, I, a lot of kids came through who, were, who didn't even realize they were abused, but were abused as children by uncles or grandpas or uh, aunts or whatever uh, in a way that wasn't like, you know, hold a knife to you and, and do things to you against your will, but just kind of like a passive form of abuse, right? And sometimes they would tell you, hey, I don't like what was done to me. But it didn't feel bad in the moment, right? Okay, is this, you know, this is a little much, I understand. Okay, so wouldn't that be confusing to the person who is abused, right? right? So imagine like a, a young boy being abused in a passive, not overtly violent way by their uncle, not necessarily liking it, but also thinking, wow, that felt good to be touched in that way. Wouldn't that be confusing? It would be. Wouldn't that produce an unnatural desire that that person would then have to struggle with throughout their entire life? It would, yeah. Vanderbilt released a new statistic. Uh, 83% of all people who identify as LGBTQ experience adverse childhood traumas such as sexual abuse, emotional abuse, or some sort of severe trauma compared to their non-LGBTQ counterparts. So that's crazy, okay? Explains a lot, doesn't it? If we, if we know that that sort of physical contact with other people, whether it's in a healthy or unhealthy way, releases endorphins that tell us, wow, this, even though I may not enjoy what's happening, it does feel good, and now they've got to struggle, to know that 83% have been abused in some way as a child, that's crazy. It explains a lot, doesn't it? It really does. And so we can look at this from two ways. We now have understanding and compassion, but we also have some, some ways to answer people who are like, well, it just feels like I was born this way. Okay? L let me just say to you very plainly, because I've read through a lot of this, there is no scientific data that can prove that somebody was born. And you can research it yourself. Uh, with same-sex attraction, okay? There's a lot of different, like, social factors, uh, like how they were raised and 
like the relationships they had growing up and the way parents dealt with them, so on so forth, so on so forth. There, but there is no homosexuality gene. All right, there's just none. And they've tried every which way to like examine different proteins and and like they've it's I'm telling you, it's extensive what they've done to try to prove that there is. There is not. Okay. But then how do you deal with someone who's like, well, I just have felt like this ever since I was a child. Well, maybe, maybe we should begin to investigate if people who, who claim that have some sort of adverse childhood experience that has propagated that in them, right? And then maybe we should give them tools so that they can then get healing and overcome what they can't control. All right? I think so. I think that's it's important. Obviously, God knew humans would eventually desire this and want to practice it. And so that, that's why um, he created a law. Uh, also because that... Again, it says it's an abomination. It's unnatural to the human spirit, the human being. Uh, when you look at what the depression rate is in the LGBT community, it becomes kind of obvious, right? Depression rate in the LGBTQ community is five times higher than those in the heterosexual community and have up to 14 times more uh, suicidal attempts than um, heterosexual counterparts. So not only is it unnatural to your being, it's harmful to you. It, it's, it's harmful to try to live contrary to how you were designed. It is. All right. The old argument was like these numbers are because they feel ostracized and they feel left out of society. And you could have made an argument for that maybe five years ago, but everything has changed, hasn't it? In fact, there's an entire month devoted to celebrating people's sexual preferences. So that's really not fair anymore. And you might say, well, like, maybe uh, they're ostracized in rural communities. Well, rural communities don't make up the majority of the LGBT community, do they? No way, right? I mean, you, you compare here, Livingston, to like San Francisco night and day. Right? So that, that doesn't make any sense. Okay? It, it's now become like almost a mandatory comply or be canceled situation where our entire culture takes the entire month of June to celebrate this one thing. And so to say that this depression and suicide rate is so high because of, ostrac of them being ostracized from society is just nonsense. I mean, it really is. It honestly is, okay? Could it be that there's a thief at hand who wants to kill, steal, and destroy? I think so. Okay, so going back to Leviticus 18, does that mean that people who are caught in it are an abomination? No, right? So we're not calling people an abomination. We're calling the practice an abomination. And this really makes me refer to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18 where he refers to the effects of pornea on our body, soul, and spirit. All right, and so this is Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, and I'm going to just read for a little bit because it's pretty good. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Okay, so what do you think he's talking about right now? He's talking about sex stuff, okay? And he gives this really good analogy here. He, sa he says, you say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. And this word is pornea, right here, sexual immorality. Anything outside the marriage covenant. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. All right, stop right there for a second. So Paul is saying, you're free, okay? We're all free, and you can do whatever you want, but you shouldn't do whatever you want. 
And he's speaking specifically about sex activities. And he says, just like your, your stomach is made for your stomach, or your stomach is made for food, right? Your bodies were made for, for pleasure. There's an appetite. Your body has an appetite for pleasure. But you shouldn't act on that hunger with immorality. So just like you get hungry, right? Do you go and then eat rotten meat because you're hungry? No, because what would that do to you? It would make you sick. Do you go eat poisonous berries? No. And so just because you have an impulse and an appetite for sexual activity, should you go fill that appetite, that hunger for it, in a way that brings harm onto your body? No. Right? And the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised the Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? And this is important because this explains the soul tie. And I'll explain the soul tie real quick because I think it's kind of important. Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? Okay? So what happens in a marriage covenant when two people become intimate with each other before the Lord? They become one, right? Did you know that you can make yourself one with people outside of covenant as well? It's called a soul tie. And people have always asked me, where do you see that in Scripture? It's right here. When you lay with somebody, when you feast upon somebody with your eyes in a sexual nature and make a connection with them, when you have an emotional tie with them, your soul, an emotional tie with them in a sexual nature... You're making your soul one with that person, but in an unholy way. It's an unholy matrimony, so to speak. And so that's harmful to you, right? And maybe some of you have had relationships outside of marriage. Know you want to move on from that relationship. Know you want to move on from that experience, but just can't. Be, and you don't know, understand why. Well, maybe you need to repent, first of all and break the soul tie that was made within that unholy covenant, okay? And so Paul lays that out really plainly right there. Two are united into one, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And then Paul says this really plainly, run, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. Well, I think this is for two reasons. One, because it feels so innate and natural to our, our being, right? But then two, because when we do it in a way that doesn't honor God, it affects our soul in a really practical way. For sexual immorality is a sin against your body. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to, given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. All right. So just like your, your, your stomach gets hungry and craves food, your flesh gets hungry and craves things of the sexual nature. And that's really uncomfortable for me to say. Hang in there, folks. You have to submit that appetite to that which is healthy. So one more time, what's the remedy for men and women's sexual desire? Marriage. Yeah, what did Paul say? Stay celibate, celibate, stay single. But if you can't, what should you do? Get married. And then just go nuts. Go hog wild. Wear it out. Once you're married, it's open season. Have at it, folks. That's what Paul said. Right? I'm just, I'm just telling you what the scriptures say. So don't get mad at me. He said just... Do what you got to do. Take care of business. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 7. I'm just going to read this for you. And if you're married and you're not engaging in this sort of connection, maybe reconsider because it's biblical to do so. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 6. Now regarding your questions you ask in your letter, could you imagine Paul opening that letter like, oh, okay. Yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations. But because there is so much sexual immorality, or what's that Greek word? Pornea. 
Each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. And this is great. I don't know if you could write anything better into this. It then says, do not deprive each other of sexual relations. So even if you're mad at them, no, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to do that. Notice how I said him, (laughs) because guys, I'm trying to help you out. Unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time, and bold, highlight, underscore, limited, limited time, so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So this is a great command. This command is for your lack of self-control. And God gives you a remedy. It's called marriage. Within the marriage covenant, have at it, friends. Anything outside of that? No. In that? Yes. I say this as a concession, not as a command. Well, okay, Paul. We would have liked it as a command. (laughs) All right. So marriage, as Jesus affirmed, was instituted in Genesis by God and can only be between a man and a woman. All right, so then another uh, critique uh, from those who would argue against me is like, well, what if a man and a man or a woman and a woman want to be in a, um, what's it called? There's three things. What did you say? No, not polyamorous. Polyamorous is multiple, like three or four or five people together. Too much, too much. Limit two. Yeah, what if... um, uh, are uh, where they're just uh, monogamous, monogamy, are in a monogamous relationship with one another. Okay? That's, how many of you have ever heard that? Well, you know, we, we're just in a monogamous relationship. We're married to one another. Well, that's fine if you want to redefine what marriage is and live outside of God's will. Okay? But according to what God said, and, and then Jesus affirming it in Matthew 19... A marriage is between a man and one one man, one woman. And here's Matthew 19, just to make it official. Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied? They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. So no in-betweens, no like half male, female hybrids. And you know, now people are, are claiming they were born animals. I'm trying, I'm really not, I don't want to make a joke. But that's just hard. That's just hard for me to wrap my brain around. So you can only be a man or a woman. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no man split apart what God has joined together. And that is the marriage covenant. It's one man, one woman. So although it's monogamous, although they feel very committed to one another, that's not marriage according to the scriptures okay you can't marry a same-sex partner in any sort of way and then be compatible with scripture that's just not how it is now you know our government is trying to redefine what marriage is and look this is a this is a new point in time i don't know uh if christians should recognize the government's definition as marriage anymore. I'm not sure if we should. Now I know we shouldn't recognize the same-sex stuff. Don't, don't hear me wrong. I don't know if we need to, to look to them to be the sanctifier of what we call marriage. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because what they've done is they've taken this beautiful covenant that was used in the founding of our nation and have twisted it and perverted it to fit an agenda, and it's just not good. And so I don't know if we need to look to them as the sanctifiers of what we call marriage anymore. You know, we get all these great tax benefits because of marriage, but is it worth it? Is it worth it to to be uh, sanctified by something that has become so ungodly? I'm not sure. I'm just putting things out in the air. Okay, one man, woman, one woman, no other options. 
Amen, hallelujah. The scriptures make clear on what sex is and how sex can be and how sex cannot be healthy. Does anybody have any questions about that? So does that, that kind of explain why we believe what we believe? So any form of homosexuality is not healthy, is not biblical. The only healthy application of sexual activity that Scripture provides is in marriage, and that's a covenant between man and woman. Like every sexual desire, it may feel like it's a part of who we are, but it's not, and it must be overcome, just like we would for any other unhealthy appetite we might find ourselves in. Okay? So, again, is the problem that you have an unhealthy desire? Not necessarily, not unless you surrender to it, right? If you surrender to it, that's the problem. If you make your unhealthy desire your identity, that becomes the problem, all right? Once a young man asked me, I, was, I used to go to the high school, and I would pass out uh, candy at lunchtime. <laughs> it was actually very effective. It was, it was very, it, some days were a waste of time. Other days, it was really effective. This is one of those days. One day, a young man stopped me as I was passing out candy because one of his friends who was in the youth group told him what I believed about homosexuality, and he just stopped me cold in the midst of handing candies out, and he said, do you really believe I'm going to hell because of my sexual preference? That was a hard question just out of nowhere. And I just looked at him and said, I'll just ask you this question. Do you really want to define your eternal destination by your sexual preference? I think that's an important question to ask. Do you really want to hinge your eternity on your sexual preference? Right? It's not me who said that you can't be Homos, that you, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God while practicing homosexuality. I never said that. That's what God said. Okay? So don't come to me as if I'm making these things up to make your life harder. I'm just telling you what God says is right and what God says is wrong. Now it's your choice if you want to believe that God holds the key to your salvation. Okay? Okay? I'm telling you, I'm not here to argue with people about how they want to live. I'm here to tell you what God says about what you choose to do with your life and how that affects you eternally. Now, you can choose to say differently, but what you're ultimately choosing to say is that you're denying God to be the God of your life and you're choosing to be your own God. And that's what this, this whole epidemic is, is people choosing to be their own God because they would rather submit to their impulsive desires rather than submit their desires to God's grace. Okay? So why is that important? Well, because if we're to believe that we're created by somebody, that somebody spoke us into existence, then we ought to find out who that person is and then we ought to find out what that purpose person says about our purpose and our identity, right? Because if I'm created by somebody and I try to define who I am by what I feel, I could be in grave danger. Right? How silly is it uh, for uh, me? Let's say I'm a, I'm a potter and I make two things. I make knives and I make forks. Right? That's all I do. I just, I have clay, I make knives, I make forks. Well, let's say one day, one of my forks says, you know what? I don't feel like a fork. I feel like a knife. And it tries to carve itself through a USDA prime rib sirloin, or prime sirloin. How effective do you think that fork is going to be? No, not effective at all. Why? Because it doesn't know its created purpose, Right? And so even though you tell yourself you, feel, you are this way because you feel this way, it doesn't matter what you feel like until you know the person who created you and what he created you for. Okay? I think it, it's uh, important to ask people who, and of course, 
Of course, um, now everything is personal. You can't talk to people without them taking what you say in a personal way uh, where they feel combative even, right? I mean, have you ever, who here has relatives that feel differently, right? Have you ever tried to talk to them about this during like Thanksgiving? <laughs> Smart. <laughs> yeah, well, for some reason, uh, in certain parts of my family, it's inevitable, okay? And I've learned over the years, really just be quiet, okay? Be quiet until you're asked to speak. But then once you're asked to speak, instead of telling people what you think to be true, why not just ask them why they believe what their, their version of the truth is, right? Because what you'll then force people to discover is that most people's version of the truth is just a reflection of what they feel. It's just the truth. Right? That's, just, that's just how it is. Most people's version of the truth is a reflection of how they feel. Fair enough. I can't be the judge of who's right and who's wrong. I don't have permission for that. All I can do is tell you what I've discovered to be the truth. But if you're going to sit before me and tell me that your version of reality is a reflection of what you feel, then you should know the consequences of if you're wrong. <laughs> right? Because the God of this culture, the God of this age, is just be whatever you want, do whatever you want, it'll all work out in the end. All paths lead in one direction. That's not what my God says. And I would just like you to know, of course we have an impasse, of course you don't agree with my version of reality, of course you don't like what I'm saying, and that's fine, I don't need you to like what I'm saying. I just need you to know that if you're going to choose that, and then be wrong, this is what my God says is reality. It's kind of sobering, right? I had a discussion once with somebody I love, uh, and they were just, that just doesn't make any sense, doesn't feel right, how could it be like that? Hey, that's fine, I'm not here to argue with you, I'm just here to present to you what I've come to know as the facts. And if you have better facts to present to me, I would love for you to do that. I, I don't, I'm not against learning. I actually want to be proven wrong so I can grow from my mistakes. But if you can't, you should be aware that the consequences of your error, of your mistake, are really severe. You should know that. And if I'm wrong, no big deal. I'm just going to float off into the universal pyramid that we all get to enjoy together, no harm, no foul. I just have to deal with the next, you know, 50 years of you not liking me as much anymore. But if I'm right, you are in danger. Okay? And so this is how you, you can present this to people is you don't have to, look, God is plenty capable to bring the right people at the right time to hear the right words from you. You just have to be ready in grace and in humility and, uh, and armed to respond in a way that gets people to think past what they feel. Okay? All right. What time is it? Is there any questions? I'm ten minutes short. Any questions? Yes. Spiritual, not a genetic, but because of the curse that weighs on the family, they become very born into. Yes. A very broken, mm -hmm. in, in moral, mm -hmm. you know, they were not, not born physically that way, but they were born into a spiritual dynamic. A hundred percent. There's a book uh, about speaking blessing over your kids. What's it called? What's it called? I don't remember, but it talks about that, about praying that off of, of uh, your children. Uh, but that's also why it's so important for us to engage and accept inner healing as a spirit-empowered discipline within the church, 
needs to happen uh, because there's so many people that have um, these impulses that have our generational origin, right, that go back generations and generations that they have no idea how to confront and deal with that need to go through inner healing so the Holy Spirit can have time to dig and expose. But I do think it helps with first understanding the truth and then being able to articulate the truth because if nobody hears the truth, how can they be saved? How can they begin the process? All right, anything else? So you know what to do tonight if you're married, right? Get cracking. Just kidding. <laughs> and if you're not married, no pornea. Just wait. Okay, uh, I'm going to pray, and then I guess we'll, we'll wrap it up. Is that okay? All right. Well, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for wisdom. We thank you for revelation knowledge. And God, we thank you that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a single person in here who hasn't struggled in some way, who hasn't trespassed or transgressed in some way. And Lord, we thank you for the gracious gift of repentance that leads to healing. So Father, right now, I just pray that if anybody in here feels conviction uh, over past relationships or past actions or uh, past transgressions, uh, Lord, that your conviction would come, which never brings shame, which never brings condemnation, would come and lead them to repentance right now so that new life can originate where there once was pain and sorrow. So, Father, for any person right now who feels conviction over their own sexual appetite, over their own uh, transgressions, Lord, just, just as we bring them before you, we repent we break any soul tie that's connected to that. We turn from that. And we say it has no more hold over our soul, over our mind, our emotions, our will. We break it off and we move forward. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, we just ask that as you bring to us people who are hurting and struggling and are in pain, God, that you would give us the right words at the right time to say the right thing that would begin people on the process of recovery and healing from the ways the enemy has uh, tore them to pieces. We thank you, God, that although it's, it's silly at times, it's hard to understand how people can be so foolish. God, you've called us to be your hands and your feet, your light to a dying generation. And God, send us so that we can bring hope into dark and dead places. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.